conversations outside the talks are better than the talks, and I fear this talk will probably continue that trend. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, because I'm the only thing keeping you between a day of fun and, uh, and, uh, and lunch and everything else, and a group photo. And a gr I don't know if the group photo is something people are looking forward to, but maybe they are. It's more fun than my seminar, for sure, I agree. Um, but I thought that, you know, um, what I do is, uh, I'm a theorist, and I'm a very much a very much theorist, and I think I, I view myself as a provocateur. So this is just gonna be a talk to provoke a lot of people. It's gonna make a lot of bombastic claims. You should take them, uh, you should argue with me. So having said that, please interrupt me. Interruptions are built into these things, make arguments. But what I'm gonna try to convince you is that now that we're thinking about microbes, we can start think and thinking about complex communities, we have to kind of revisit these kind of classical models of ecology and community ecology that were developed initially by people like you know, Hutchinson's, Levins, MacArthur, uh, among the few, Tillman, blah, 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 the list goes on, but I've, been, I've found these papers about four years ago and they really transformed my view of the world. But also in reading them now, in the present age, I realized there were real limitations that we have to overcome. And I'm gonna try to argue to you that uh, statistical physics uh, can help us overcome these limitations. And in particular, what I'm gonna talk about today are essentially, does this work? Maybe, okay. What I'm gonna talk about today are mostly niche-based models and these kind of niche-based models, maybe the most canonical example of this are these MacArthur warblers. And so these are these two kinds of birds. And you know, the idea was how do they coexist on the tree? And so there were detailed, painstakingly observations, and the idea was that they figured out that one of these kind of birds lived up in the leaves. Oh, thank you. Do you want me to plug it in as well? No, that's okay. Uh, one of these things lived up in the leaves, and the other one lived in the beak, uh, on, the, on the bark. And so the basic idea was that each thing had a resource it was best at consuming. And basically, the, these red birds were competitively excluded from up here, and the green birds were competitively excluded from here. And given if we take this as our central intuition, then it becomes kind of tricky to understand how we get these very complicated microbial communities. And so the question is, how do you get something where coexistence is generic or what's not, and when we don't do this? So um, the next quote is my first provocation which is, why are we so surprised by cooperation and coexistence, right? And Chris Marks dared me to put Donald Trump in here, so I put Donald Trump in here. Um, and, and so I would argue that we're really influenced by the world we live in. And the world we live in is a dog-eat-dog -dog neoliberal world. And in particular, you know, this, there's this very famous Margaret Thatcher quote, as you know, there's no such thing as society, there are only individual men and women. And what Margaret Thatcher, of course, meant was that we have to look at the units that we, to, if you want to understand the whole, the only way you can think about it is by looking at the units that make it up, right? Is this, and it is very much this idea that what defines society and the whole is competition at the level of the individual. And then, you know, this, this, is, just a, this is just a quote from Donald Trump about uh, cheaters. And, uh, and we can make of why we're obsessed with these things, but I would try to argue that, you know, A lot of evidence suggests, at least in the microbial world, that it should be pretty generic and easy to get coexistence, right? At least every place we look. And the question, of course, is why? And so, um, and so what I'm gonna try to argue, from, argue to you is a style of modeling that is not bottom up, but top down, and that basically uses statistical physics. And the basic idea is that maybe to understand these communities, we don't wanna start building them up one by one. So Jeff, Jeff is okay with this because Jeff gave me an office for my sabbatical, so. But, but we do have these kind of very different philosophical worldviews about how, when things become simple. So there, I would argue there's three, there's two different ways to make a problem simple. One is to break it up into its little parts and look at what's happening. But in statistical physics, we know there's another limit where things become simple, which is in the limit of many, many, many things interacting together. Right? And this is because largely things become statistical and we can use things like the central limit theorem. And so what I'm gonna try to argue is that, you know, if we start from a slightly different philosophical uh, prejudices, you, get with, you end up with slightly different kinds of models. And these kind of models are good for answering different questions, let's say, right? And, and maybe it's worth exploring this opposite view where you don't go from the bottom down but the top up. So, um, so I would argue in the strong form, 
that we kind of have to overcome this Cartesian fallacy. We can't understand the community function by just understanding how the individual parts function in isolation. And that secondly, organize, organisms modify their environment. We've seen that throughout this conference. I think that's been a running theme and can transform the statistical structure of this environment. And this is, I'm gonna argue this is especially true in the microbial communities because there's no trophic layer separation in the classic sense that you see in classical ecology. And finally, this is something Simon also hinted at, the properties of large ecosystems with many species cannot be extrapolated from small ecosystems, because, I would argue, because of you get new emergent properties that come, and especially this kind of environmental structuring. So, um, so again, the goal of this talk, and I'm gonna show you experiments that Alvaro is gonna dwell on a lot more, but there are experiments that end up, uh, end up all this bob babbling. Uh, which is the goal is to build theoretical models where we incorporate the organism as active subjects in its own construction of its own environment. And a lot of these ideas are not mine. They're written by this very famous, uh, famous pair of evolutionary uh, ecologists and evolutionary biologists who have influenced my thinking more than anyone on this field. And I will constantly refer to Rich Dick Levin's papers throughout this talk. But I, I found this book quite, uh, quite provocative and quite interesting. So here is uh, essentially the outline of the talk. We're gonna start, we're, and the, again, the goal is gonna be to try to revisit these classical models in theoretical ecology, but think about them in large ecosystems. So we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce to you some of these classical niche paradigm of theoretical community ecology. I'm gonna introduce you to the model that we're gonna study throughout with many, many modifications to try to make it applicable to large and microbial things, which is MacArthur's consumer resource model. And then I'm gonna show you how we are trying to basically turn that into a StatMac model. Instead of thinking about MacArthur's consumer resource models with one or two species and one or two resources, we're asking, can we analyze it in the opposite limit? Where you have many resources and many species. And then the last part, I'm gonna tell you how if you incorporate cross-feeding, uh, you, you, you can get very generic thing. You, you can almost guarantee coexistence. And I'll show you some experiments at the end that uh, seems to suggest this might not be as crazy as it seems. So, um, so let's start with some classical paradigm of theoretical ecology or niche-based theories. And so, um, again, uh, you know, theoretical ecology is an extremely well-developed field. The papers are just absolutely brilliant. I'm kind of sad I didn't read them into, until I was in my mid-30s. Um, but, you know, um, one of the defining things is this kind of niche theory, which is the theory of competitive exclusion, as I explained to you before. The basic idea is that things compete for resources and everything has to be best at something. And I think the, most, the simplest version of this and the, probably one of the most influential is Tillman's R-star theory, which basically says that every species basically has to be best at utilizing some resource in the environment. And the experimental you know, observations of these were largely developed using very macroscopic things, birds, trees, grasses. This is a picture of some famous uh, experiments with grass that David Tillman did out in Minnesota. These are called the grass experiments. They're quite influential in the 80s. And the central intuition, again, that I want you to keep in mind is that the number of species is strictly limited by the number of li limiting resources in the environment. And this is, of course, because of competitive exclusion. So that's not true. Well, of course it's not true. This is why I, I yeah, go ahead. You, you asked for it. No, I did ask for it, no, no. So Tillman's theory only applies to purely exploitative situations. Agreed. Where species do not interfere with each other. Agreed. And so species can be limited to be better at particular resource utilization, or they can interfere with each other, or they can be better at dealing with predation or, or some other limiting factor. So it doesn't have to be the number. Resources in the very general, uh, okay, I don't know. I mean, when you read Chesson or you read what the modern synthesis, they, they like to use resource in a very general term, like the ability to avoid predation. This is part of what I found. So that's, that's your counting as a resource? Uh, I, I mean, no, I, I'm trying to give the simplest version of this, but yes, I agree with you. If, 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 if the primary mediator of ecological interactions is the consumption of resources, then this is, this, this is true. The result is an equilibrium Agreed. Absolutely, temporal niches, spatial niches, every, every kind of thing that's going on. So we're gonna think about these experiments we're talking about, we're trying to mimic steady state and where, where we're gonna do this. Of course, there, there's, a, like I said, very rich field. I, I'm giving some caricature because I wanna say, even within niche-based theories, I think these kind of, these kind of intuitions are quite, quite limited. No, I agree with you, I, I'm not trying to back. <laughs> All right, so, um, so again, I promise you, this is really the only equations that are gonna be in this talk. 
But the basic idea of MacArthur's consumer resource model is basically you have some resources, and they're consumed by each species, and species have different preferences for different resources. And the idea is that your growth rate is just proportional to how many resources you consume, weighted by some energy, at minus some minimum cost you need to maintain yourself. And the resources themselves can have some dynamics, but importantly, they're depleted from the environment. So this is, this is just one of the standard models that's been used. And what's interesting is that in the limit where the dynamics of the resources are quite fast, um, and they don't get eliminated, you can show that this reduces exactly to these Locke Volterra equations that Jeff was using. Yes? Oh yeah, there's tons of things that ignore. So this is no, no, God no. It's a, it's a, it's a type zero re response function, as they say. This is the dumbest model you can write down. Like, everything independently eats things, and they're all generalists. Right? It's dumb. It's dumb. Dumb models don't mean they can't give you insight. And that, that, that's a, I mean, no, no, it's not realistic at all, and it's not meant to be realistic. I think that's that's kind of its purpose. <laughs> right? And the important point I want to point out is there's this concept concept of niche overlap which basically says the more, in, in these kind of models, there's purely competition for resources. And the basic idea is that the more similar the resources you want to consume are, the more you compete with each other. All right, so that's what I mean, niche overlap. Do you know about the Connell's argument about the ghost of competition? I, I, you, you can assume I know nothing to a first approximation, except for what... <laughs> That's evidence that they uh, evolutionarily or otherwise competitively displaced. So the species that coexist are probably species that are not. Uh, All right. Uh, but with yeah, the, but I don't. I, I, that seems circular to me. But okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. No, it's just <laughs> measuring measuring niche overlap in terms of what resources are used may not be good evidence. It, it may be. It's what inspired MacArthur to look at the. And how it is that they manage to coexist, even yeah. though they utilize what appears to be the same resource. No, I, yeah. I, but within the MacArthur framework, this is pure credit. Uh, all right. Uh, right. So the way I think, every, uh, I don't know, way, the way I've seen it in the literature, now I'm just getting scared um, <laughs> that, well, <laughs> that everything is going to be wrong. But I'll keep on pretending I understand ecology and telling you my interpretation of ecology, which is the physicist jumps in three years ago, reads a bunch of papers, and synthesizes it probably wrong, interpretation of community ecology. Uh, which is, um, so, so I, you know, there's these kind of graphical ways to analyze these models that people are really interested in. And what they all, and the basic point uh, in all this kind of stuff is uh, if you look at it, you know, one thing you can look at is the niche overlap here, which is how much things two species compete. And so the way they do these things is they basically analyze these models in these situations where you have one or two species and ask what happens. So here, you know, this is the kind of, kind of fa phase diagram I would call it in physics that you can get. So here on this x-axis, you have niche overlap, how much they you know, compete for the same resources. Here you have basically intrinsic fitness differences. And the idea is that the bigger the niche overlap is, the smaller the region of coexistence, right? The more similar the fitness of these species have to be. So over here, species two excludes species one. Here, species one excludes species two. And in particular, if the niche overlap is zero, that means they occupy independent, they consume independent resources so they can always coexist. If the niche overlap is one, they compete for exactly the same thing and you always have competitive exclusion, right? So this is, this is kind of what's going on. And there's another version of this I won't tell you, which is, there's a way to, that this picture is exactly the same as that picture, but the thing you want to take away is that species, must, I mean, the end goal of all this, way people have uh, summarized, is that species must compete with more with other members of its each species than others, right? And another way of saying it is each species must have its own limiting resource. So that, uh, and, and I want to emphasize that most of these intuitions, when people say things like this, they basically analyze these things using two species or two resources. There's very few works. I look through everything where you don't have well-mixed uh, uh, things that I could find where you want to do this in the large, uh, large thing limit. So, um, so I want to point out what I think are the limitations of thinking about this way 
for the current paradigms of microbial community ecology. And the first, I think, is one that's also experimentally true. It's not clear that intuitions from few species scale up to complex ecosystems with many species. And you can have the emergence of new behaviors. And for those of you, because there's a diverse crowd, there's this one of the great theoretical physicists of the 20th century, oh, well, he's still alive, uh, Phil Anderson, but uh, wrote this amazing piece in Science More is Different, which is essentially an essay arguing about emergent properties. And the basic idea is the constructionist hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of scale and complexity. The behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particle, it turns out, is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear, and the understanding of the new behaviors requires research, which I think is as fundamental in nature as any other. But the basic idea is that you can't understand the whole by understanding, taking apart the pieces and then putting them back together. Um, and so the question is, how much does that hold even in these classical, simple, dumb model, which is the MacArthur consumer resource model, right? If I consider many, many species and many, many resources. The second, I think, important thing is that niche-based models often focus on a single trophic layer. So they think about, you know, all the herbivores. But, you know, microbes, they don't each eat other animals. They exchange small molecules that produce and eat them. And so niche-based models assume a trophic layer separation that's no longer true in the microbial world. You really have, generically, the thing is that you're not eating other microbes, you're eating small molecules. And I, as I'll try to convince you, that completely changes the intuition that we kind of try to implicitly inherit from these things. Yeah. Uh, okay, but, but I mean, the small molecules diffuse far. It, okay, in well-mixed cultures, right? So if I grow something in liquid culture. No, I, I agree with you. So the question is how much geography, I have nothing to say about geography at the moment, even though I live next to Carol, which is really, really depressing, but it, it's true. But yeah, I agree with you. So I, I, I'm not gonna tell you about spatial structure. I'm gonna think about the dumbest model and show you even in the dumbest model, things change dramatically. Yeah. Is, is what? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So viruses are a different layer, right? Yeah, no, I agree with you. So, so vi viruses and bacteria is a classic trophic layer separation. So I'm just going to think about all the bacteria in, in a thing. I, I agree with you. Your statements are all correct. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show you, uh, oh, I'm doing okay on time, is I'm going to show you uh, some work that we've uh, developed with Madhu Advani at Harvard, who's mostly a neuroscientist, but it turns out these techniques are things across things. And Guy Bunin, who just started at the Technion, and he's, he's, really, he's, really, he's really a smart physicist thinking about this stuff. So if, you, if you're in Israel, you should, you should look him up. He's really good. Um, and so the basic idea now, again, is that there's actually two regimes where things get simple. One is when I consider a small number of things. But the other thing, other place where things get simple, is when I have many, many degrees of freedom. And so what we're gonna try to do is analyze this stupid model, not in the limit where I have two species and two resources, but where I have infinite number of species and infinite number of resources, and I fix the ratio between the two, right? And this is what goes by the name of mean field theory in physics, but I've been told in ecology, mean field theory means something completely different from what it means in physics, so I'm not allowed to use that word. Oh, okay. Someone told us it means something completely different. Okay, so the idea is, again, right, this is just a drawing from a Gaussian distribution. You see, eventually, everything looks like a Gaussian if I start drawing numbers. And that's because I have some kind of simplicity when n goes to infinity. And so the price you pay is you talk about micro, macroscopic quantities like pressure and distributions instead of thinking about individual things. So if I want to describe a gas of particles, I can't tell you anything about the position, but I can still tell you about macroscopic quantities. And the question is, can we do something like that in ecology? where I can't tell you anything about any particular species, but I can tell you about macroscopic quantities. And so the basic idea is gonna be, again, we come back to this, you know, you know you, we come back to this kind of thing, and we basically draw, uh, consider the case where the number of species and the number of resources is extremely large, and then we just draw all the parameters, I need lots of parameters, so I just draw them from a random distribution. And this is something that May introduced already in ecology 
almost 40, 45 years ago, right? So I'm gonna draw these with random matrices and the hope is that I'm studying typical ecosystems. And so in order to understand what's really a result of biology, as opposed to what's a result of, you know, some very detailed biological interaction and what is a result of just having large diverse uh, communities, we have to understand what you get for free for just having large dynamic, you know, diverse communities where everything is drawn randomly. And so the quantities that we really turns out we're gonna care about is this kind of growth rate. I'm gonna replace this whole thing with a growth rate. And what I'm gonna do here is say that the resource has some effective carrying capacity. So I have some baseline carrying capacity that I would have in the absence of all the species. And what happens is the presence of these species actually just changes this to some, oh, changes this to some other number. And the important point for all our observations is that this growth rate is a sum of many, many, many terms. And this carrying capacity, effective carrying capacity, is also a sum of many, 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 many terms. And so what we can do is we can say the growth rate should actually be well modeled by some Gaussian distribution, because it's a sum of many, many, many terms. And the effective carrying capacity should also be well modeled by some kind of Gaussian uh, approximation. It turns out to be a truncated Gaussian for technical reasons I'm not gonna tell you about. And what we're gonna do, and for the physicists in the thing, this is a two-step cavity method for self-consistency things. It's used in spin glasses and it's been used in Huffield model and compressed sensing. It's actually quite a technical calculation. But the basic idea is I take my ecosystem and I throw in a new species and I throw in a new resource. And this is an argument that Levins and MacArthur were running already in the 60s. But now you ask self-consistently, what's the probability it's gonna survive? And since every species is the same as every other species in a random ecosystem, you can self-consistently solve for means, variances, and things like that. And so let me show you what happens. What I wanna show you is that you draw these kind of coefficients from different distributions. So you can draw them from, uh, you can draw them from a binomial distribution where the CI alpha, the cons consumer coefficients are binary. You can draw them from Gaussian distribution and you can run numerical simulations for all these nonlinear PDEs, or you can solve these kind of self-consistence equations, and for things like the fraction of species that survive, the fraction of resources that survive, the, the mean number of, uh, the mean abundance of the resource, the, the mean abundance of the resource, the mean abundance of the things, any statistical quantity you can come up with, you can actually calculate that analytically, which is very surprising to us, because these are a bunch of nonlinear PDEs that are coupled. And so what we can do, yeah? Oh, I mean ODEs, 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 nonlinear ODEs. No, 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 I just said the wrong thing. Uh, all right, so, you know, I'm not gonna show you all the calculations and technical things, but one of the interesting things that you find once is that once you go to a large ecosystem, you can generically ask, are the properties of the isolated ecosystem different from when the things are there? And so on the left-hand side, what I plotted on the x-axis is the fitness of a bacteria if it was introduced into a, an ecosystem by itself. And on the right, uh, and on the y-axis is its final abundance if in the presence of everyone else. And what you see is there's some correlation which we can calculate analytically, but there's a bunch of stuff that's high fitness that goes away. And there's a bunch of resources that go away. There's even things that flip sign. And so what you get is generically, even though you can say something about the whole ecosystem by thinking about things in isolation, actually the ecosystem is sufficiently engineered that you can't actually make, the correlation you get is about 0.6, right? So it's true that good things on average do better than good, that's great, right? And, you're, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other things do badly. And in particular, there's things that it turns out that you can, you know, you can, you can have things that have, you know, that won't survive without the environment, that do survive when the environment's there, and all these things, but all these things about environmental engineering, when I was thinking about this, got us thinking a little bit more about how we can modify this for the microbial world, right? Because here, the only way you can change the external environment is just by depleting resources. But imagine how much more dramatic the environmental engineering would be if I also produced small molecules, right? So before, uh, before going on, I, you know, I just wanted to argue that what we did is on a technical level, we have a way of doing the statistical mechanics of this MacArthur consumer resource model. We can match all these simulations analytically, which kind of shocked us. And the properties of, iso of individuals in isolation can differ significantly from those in the complex ecosystem. And the practical 
implication of all this, and I'm going to try to convince you, is that we always want to build things by characterizing each individual part. But maybe they function very different in the whole than they do in the individual. And that's true even in this dumb model where, the interaction, where it's been chosen to minimize the interactions between things. Right? This is the best case scenario for non-interacting things. So, um, so what I want to do is now talk about how we're extending this to microbial communities. And the stars of this kind of thing are Josh Goldford, who's Daniel's student, who helped me, with, who, who did some of the started the initial experiments and has done all the analysis. And Nancy, who's sitting somewhere in this thing, who's been doing all these experiments in Alvaro's lab. Uh, and so what we've been now thinking about is, you know, as I said before, there's no clear trophic layer separation. Bacteria eat small molecules, not each other, uh, not each other's. And of course, bacteria killing each other also releases small molecules. And so what we want to ask is cross-feeding means microbes construct their own environment and implies we no longer can think of organisms in a fixed external environment. And so we have to think about how they change the environment in other things. So there's this quote I like, the incorporation of the organism as an active subject in its own ontogeny, ontogeny and in the construction of its own environment leads to a, a complex dialectical relationship between the elements of the triad of the gene, environment, and organism. And I think we've always kind of neglected the environment. And so even in these models, we've kind of neglected the environment. And so what we can do is we can just take the original consumer resource model, where everything just competed, and just add a simple term that says that when you consume things, you also produce things. Okay. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I agree, but I think it's impossible to avoid that in the microbial world, whereas you can... Uh, but usually you just focus on a trophic layer, right? That's the way I read the literature. I mean, I think that's what makes these models kind of... No, I... No, no, of course. The question is, is it the, ex okay, it, it, the question is, can we make a reasonable ecological theory without taking into account environmental engineering, which a lot of these kind of Chase, Liebold, and all these kind of guys, they kind of assume fixed environments. And, 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 and so, okay, my only point, okay, I agree with, I, can, I, I don't know philosophically. All I can tell you is we took this model, we've never seen this done, and we just added one little term that says, in addition to consuming resources, I can produce resources. Right? And you can just, here I'll just show you simulations, right? So you take, you know, kind of these things, and you put them in a single externally supplied resource, and you ask what happens. So in the absence of cross-feeding, if you have a single resource in the environment, you get a single species surviving. In the presence of cross-feeding, as soon as you allow cross-feeding, generically, no matter how you choose the random matrices, no matter what you do, as long and you enforce some energy balance, it seems to be that you can have very complex communities living on a single resource. It's a, it's a generic, it seems to be the norm and not the exception, as soon as you even allow a modicum of cross-feeding, a tiny bit of cross-feeding, right? And more, moreover, if you, you know, look at the results, the structure of the community is shaped by the external resource. So for example, here, what we did is we just, for each community, we took the co co coefficients that it consumed, CI alpha, weighted by the number of things there, and we just did some dimensional reduction. And what you see is that resource A kind of clusters here, resource B kind of clusters here, resource C kind of clusters here. If you look at the consumption rate of the resource, you know, it, it kind of, you know, if you put it in resource C, you consume the metagenome, it's much more likely to consume C. Just very obvious stuff, but you get these kind of things, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Uh, in this thing, it's just, uh, in these resource types, uh, they're all pretty, they're, they're just random. They're just randomly chosen. Everything is random. So all, that, all that's true is that the species, different species have different coefficients for consuming resources. Oh, here, oh, no, no, here it was, if, if you put it in an environment with resource C, then you enrich for things that eat C. That's it. It's, 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 it this is just a statement saying that, I, I, I throw a bunch of species in randomly, then some of them will survive. Now, in the surviving species, I am obviously, if, I'm in if I put in resource C, I'm enriched for things that have 
that can eat resource C. Here it's saying, I, here I took all my things and threw them, right, different communities in three different resources, A, B, and C. So each one is a different simulation, each, each little point in there. Different species survive in each simulation because it's all done randomly. And then you ask, what's the structure? And the structure you see is that, is that you, things group by resource. Otherwise, the same. They're just randomly drawn. I mean, there's some distributions we're drawing everything from, but yeah, they're all the same. Everything is the same. This is the null model, right? Everything's the same. Everything is random. How much of biology can it explain? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, so. Okay, so. It's species I can consume resource alpha and produce resource beta. That's what, what, what I added. Before, you couldn't produce a resource. So now I take resource alpha, and I produce resource beta, and I have to enforce energy constraints. I didn't feel like writing the full equation. I have to enforce energy constraints on all these things. But you're, it's not that you're just pumping in more energy into the system. No, they're not. They're not any different. They're not any different. No, no, you just can consume things and produce things. And they are the stoichiometric coefficients of how many of alpha do I eat and how many of beta do I produce. That's it. That's all it is. But then I'm looking for steady states, right? There's some dynamics associated with this. So resources can get depleted, resources can get produced, and you do this. Oh, there's no, there's no, huh? I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I can uh, explain to you afterwards, Matteo. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure, but all I want to tell you is that if this is zero, then I only get one species surviving. And if it's not zero, I generically get lots of species. All right. So Alvaro is going to tell you all about these experiments. Nancy has a poster that you should go see. But you can ask, you know, the, the claim should be that our null model shouldn't be that it's really hard to get coexistence on a single resource, but it should be really, really easy if there's cross-feeding. And so you, you know, they did these experiments that they'll tell you much more about, but they basically isolated this leaf and soil samples all around Boston and New Haven. You basically passage them for 14 days, 80 to 160 generations, grow them on many, 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 many carbon sources. This is the list, single carbon resource things. Alvaro and Nancy will tell you much more. And you can ask what happens. And I'm not gonna dwell on this data, but what you should see is that all these things have lots and lots of color in them. And that means that generically, what you have here are some sugar sources. Here you have some relative abundances. And what you see is it's indeed true that generically in these communities that you isolate, you grow them on a single carbon source in M9 media, and you do get generic coexistence. It just seems to be generically true, right? And Alvaro will show you all of the experiments. Nancy's poster has all the little things, checking everything and all that stuff. I don't feel comfortable. But the one piece of other data I'll show you is now you can just basically take, we do 16S sequencing so that we don't have a true metagenome, but we can use this, essentially this pie crust program, but any other version of this, where you take the 16S, map it to a species, ask what genes it has in it. And so this is essentially some proxy for the metagenome. And you can ask what happens, you can do some dimensional reduction on it, and you see indeed, again, the metagenome segregates by what resource you put in. So all the glucose communities here, these are eight, you know, eight, many, many communities from many, many different places. They all go here. All the citrate communities go here. You know, all the leucine communities go here. And indeed, you're enriched, you know, in a community where you're in, you know, in leucine, you're, in, you know, you're enriched for leucine degradation. And it's exactly like our model that actually had no biology in it at all, right? That was just drawn randomly. Everything was drawn randomly. So you could make a very, deep biological story of what, what, what's going on, this interaction, that interaction. But you seem to get this kind of structure for free in large communities, right? At least that's, you know, all the provocative stuff is my ideas. Alvaro is probably gonna get up here tomorrow and tell you that I'm full of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm completely wrong. But that, that's my take on how I interpret, his, I interpret their data, right? And so um, what I want to tell you, I mean, I'm out of time and this is what I wanted to tell you, is that um, you could take this classical model from community ecology, the consumer resource module, which would tell you that it should be very hard to get coexistence. You put a little bit of cross-feeding in, any small amount, 
And what it tells you is that actually, no, 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 coexistence is completely generic. And so, um, and it leads to qualitatively different behaviors. And the reason is that in this cross-feeding model, you can't separate out the organism from the environment. You're taking into, you're generically incorporated the idea that the or, you can't talk about organisms without the fact that change the environment they live in. And so, you know, one way of summarizing this is bacteria construct their own niches and need to think about the environment and species together on equal footing. And we actually have a much more, if you're interested in ecology, it's a very rich place. We have a way of putting thermodynamics into all these models so we can ask, if I put a total amount of energy into these models, what can happen? We have intriguing results that suggest that thermodynamic efficiency, that you can partially order steady states based on thermodynamic efficiency. There's tons of stuff you can do with these things. And they're all with random models. Right? So there's a lot of structure that emerges when you consider large models, even when you choose everything randomly. And that's something you know, we should kind of know. So here are the acknowledgments. You know, um, and so Madhu Advani helped me with this first part, which was this technical cavity calculation. Josh and Nancy, who's over here, and you should really talk to, uh, did uh, you know, the second part of the project is really theirs. Uh, Alvar is going to tell you all about this tomorrow. And uh, Carol helped us make the model better. I wrote a really crappy version of this model, and Carol fixed it for us. Daniel, as always, uh, is, is one of the most artistic and interesting people to have as a colleague. It's a, it's a real pleasure. And these people gave me a lot of money. Thank you very much.